Ideologies of the Modern Era, a Comparative Analysis. And so what we're looking at then are isms, right? Liberalism, classic liberalism, neo or new liberalism, progressivism, anarchism, socialism, fascism, authoritarianism, totalitarianism, the isms, or a comparative analysis to the ideas of the modern era. And so this is our seminar question. And it's to compare and contrast the main elements of classic liberalism, new liberalism, Marxist socialism, and fascism. So again, to compare and contrast classic liberalism, new liberalism, Marxist socialism, and fascism. And so if I do my job correctly tonight, by the end of our, by the end of our time together, we'll have identified these given you some historic and some contemporary and give you a point-by-point -point sheet that you can go down and compare and contrast one against the other. Okay. <clears throat> so, everybody's... So then, our roadmap for tonight is to examine classic liberalism and new liberalism. We're going to take a look quickly at nationalism and statolatry. The term statolatry, as we'll show, coined by Ludwig von Meissens, um, and its participation in several different ideologies. We're going to look at Marxist socialism and communism. We'll look at anarchism, fascism, totalitarianism, and authoritarianism. But before we go any further, as always, we define our terms, right? So what is an ideology? Now, however many, 10 weeks ago, when I first trotted out the definition of an ideology, you may remember that I used the analogy of a bouquet of balloons, right? Where a bouquet of balloons as an entity, as a thing, is one whole made up of separate ideas. So an ideology, a political ideology, is a system of coherent and interconnected ideas that present a reasonably clear vision of how human social existence should be organized. And so this ideology then is first expressed for our purposes tonight in classic liberalism. We touched on classic liberalism, although you didn't know that we were doing it, when we looked at the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution, however many weeks ago. We said that classic liberalism is a philosophy committed to the idea of limited government and liberty of individuals, including freedom of religion, speech, press, assembly, and going a step further than we had before, the idea of the free market, right, or the political economy, as we'll discuss created and explained by Adam Smith. <clears throat> so you may remember these six key pillars of classic liberalism individualism, property and law, contracts and law, freedom, equality, and democracy. So these were six key elements that I introduced when we were looking at the Declaration of Independence, and you may remember that I asked you to identify this, these six key elements in the Declaration of Independence and in contemporary American political society. This was on a, one of our midterm questions that many of you chose to answer. So we're ex looking at it again afresh, but this time with a little more vehemence, a little more in-depth examination. So first we'll start with Adam Smith, going on to David Hume, John Locke, and Immanuel Kant. And I'm also going to introduce you to briefly Jean-Baptiste Say, Thomas Malthus, and David Ricardo, who are going to cont contribute to the philosophic conversation about classic liberalism. So, Adam Smith. Now, you've heard this name before, the wealth of nations. And so, Adam Smith's idea is the free market, or the invisible hand of the free market, helping to contribute to a political economy. A political economy, insofar as how we come together and live politically as social beings, the social contract, with an eye toward an economic model as the driver for that. Right, so this free market capitalism that you hear tell of, democracy and capitalism, is going to be Adam Smith's um, playground. Laissez-faire means really 
vaguely, leave well enough alone. Hands off, laissez-faire, leave it alone. If it works, it works well. And so what it is, is the invisible hand of the market driving competition and by competition incentivizing efficiency in the economy that leads to the self-regulation of the free market. And I'm going to go through all these uh, in more detail. The self-regulation of the free market. And this allows for utilitarianism. And we're going to talk about utilitarianism as a concept enshrined in classic liberalism and new liberalism. And then utilitarianism as defined as the greatest good for the greatest number. This leading to the political economy that says, what is the best for most people in our system of government? How do the, the most benefit from uh, whatever policy we might have? And so again, we start with natural prices. So I have an apple, and I want to sell the apple. I say it's worth a dollar. You say it's worth 50 cents. And so somewhere in the middle of that, we agree that the apple is worth 75 cents. We agree because that ends up what you're being, you're willing to spend for the apple and what I'm willing to let the apple go for, right? And so you can have set prices where if you have a monopoly and I have all the apples, I can charge a dollar because there is no other place to get an apple. However, if the guy down the street is selling his apple for less, you have a choice. And so it's that choice then that leads to natural prices. Somewhere in the compromise between his apple and my apple, we're going to find what an apple is really worth, i.e. what you can pay for it, what you're willing to pay for it, in a free market. And so these natural prices then lead to competition. If we've determined that an apple is worth 75 cents, and I'm able to produce an apple somehow five cents cheaper, that apple is still worth five or 75 cents to you, but I make an extra nickel because I've made that apple, gotten that apple to market five cents cheaper, right? And so this idea of natural prices, the natural amount that somebody's going to pay for a commodity is going to lead to competition because if you can bring that commodity to market cheaper and still sell it at the natural price, then you're going to make more money. So this competition incentivizes efficiencies. If I'm going to make more money by bringing that apple to market cheaper, I'm going to find ways by hook or by crook to bring that apple to market cheaper. And so you're telling me to be more efficient. You're going to cause me, you're going to force me to be more efficient if I want to make that extra nickel off that apple. Well, this leads to the self-regulation of the free market. Because the person who makes the better mousetrap, the person who's able to get the commodity to market cheaper and in the best shape is going to win, right? And so the market is going to self-regulate. Those people who are selling apples for a dollar are going to go out of business. And so only those people who are able to compete will be able to remain standing in the market. And so doesn't this really allow for utilitarianism? So you're getting an apple at the natural price I'm going to work my tail off to make sure that that apple is fresh and delivered to you, right, in the best state possible. And so the market, by self-regulating, is going to ensure that it's getting the best produce, the best product possible, yes? Because you're not going to stand for anything less. If there's a better apple to be had for the same price, by God, you're going to go get it. So if my apple has worms in it, I'm not going to succeed. So it self-regulates through utilitarianism. And again, utilitarianism is the greatest good for the greatest number. And so, to capstone what Adam Smith is saying in his Wealth of Nations, little else is requisite to carry a state to the highest degree of opulence from the lowest barbarism, but peace, easy taxes, and a tolerable administration of justice, all the rest being brought about by the natural course of laissez-faire, free market, hands-off, that if you give people peace, right, a stable, peaceful society, give them easy taxes, right, don't ride them too hard, 
and a tolerable administration of justice ensuring contracts and law, that all the rest, going from barbarism to an opulent state, will be created by the free market or the political economy. Check? As, okay, and so this is, um, this is Adam Smith and his Wealth of Nations. And then um, David Hume is writing his work of the principles, of the first principles of government. I'm gonna do a little bit of reading tonight, you'll have to forgive me, but I want these philosophers to speak for themselves. They do so much more clearly than I. So here we go. This is David Hume on the first principles of government. Nothing appears more surprising to those who consider human affairs with a philosophical eye than the easiness with which the many are governed by the few and the implicit submission with which men resign their own sentiments and passions to those of their rulers. When we inquire by what means this wonder is effected, we shall find that as force is always on the side of the governed, the governors have nothing to support them but opinion. It is therefore on opinion only that government is founded. And this mass maxim extends to the most despotic and most military governments, as well as to the most free and popular. The Sultan of Egypt and the Emperor of Rome might drive his harmless subjects like brute beasts against their sentiments and inclination, but he must at least have led his Marmelukes or his Praetorian bands like men by their opinion. So he's saying the opinion then of the populace is the foundation of government, no matter how despotic um, or how militaristic or free. So David Hume is contributing to the idea of the uh, vibrant marketplace of ideas leading by opinion in a free society. Immanuel Kant is going to be talking about the Reichstag, or in this German philosophy, the right state, the state that is best suited for the people that it's governing. And he's going to write, the Republic or Restac can be viewed as a social system uniting two distinct subsystems. This, this correct state, this right state. The first subsystem is that of socioeconomic activity. Ah, socioeconomic activity. So he's hearkening back to Adam Smith and the political economy. Here, he says, individual citizens have an equal right to exercise their liberty under law in order to ensure this liberty and equality, we derive a number of fundamental rights, including the right to choose a religion, to choose a marriage partner, to choose an occupation, to accumulate property through one's labor, to trade one's property with others, and so on. The socioeconomic relationships of master and slave or feudal lord and serf are not comparable to these rights. Instead, the networks binding the members of society together in this Reichstag, this, this correct state, are based upon free transactions of individuals, central among which are contractual transactions in the marketplace. The second subsystem is the actual state. And we're going to be talking about the difference between a state and a nation in a second, but the state is the government that represents the nation. So the second subsystem, says Kant, is the state. Here laws require, here laws which ensure that those exercising their freedom in society do not infringe upon the freedom of others are passed, enforced, and judged in their application. The state, therefore, is divided into the legislative, executive, and judicial branches of government, respectively. Sound familiar? So he's saying two things. One, we organize ourselves by socioeconomic means, right? The free market, as a la Adam Smith, and that governments, states, rise to allow that socioeconomic basis to continue, to flourish, to allow it to be stable. You guys with me? Okay, good. So this is Kant, and again, this is um, uh, uh, just a, a very brief introduction to some of these philosophers. If you're interested in them, there's so much out there to read. Um, and so classic liberalism can also be evidenced in the Declaration of Independence, right? If you're looking at individualism, contracts and law, we said this however many weeks ago, that we find this expressed by the words we the people, right? The right state, 
the society coming together to form a social contract, and we the people, right? The, um, the first words of the Constitution in the preamble. You find in the Declaration of Independence the ideas of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, or life, liberty, and property. Now, just a quick set aside of classic liberalism, especially in view of the American Revolution compared to the French Revolution of 1789. Individualism is the key here. Life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, each three of these are reference to the individual. The individual's life, liberty, and the individual's pursuit of happiness. The motto of the French Revolution was liberty, equality, and fraternity. Now, liberty speaks to the individual, but equality is the individual in place of a society equal to whom? Fraternity is our relationship within a political society with one another. So again, although it refers to the individual, it's the individual in the place of a collective. So two out of three of these, these hallmarks of the French Revolution are a collective assignation. Only one is an individual assignation. Does that make sense? Okay. So classic liberalism is evidenced in the Constitution, also in the Bill of Rights. We know this because the Bill of Rights were intended to protect the individual against the arbitrary for, uh, force of government, right? So really, everything old is new again. And in this, I'm going to refer you to a terrible book that I wrote many years ago, The Transformation of Global Geopolitics, where I put together um, 30 theorems that try to describe the geopolitical forces at play in the world at that point. And so in this, my theorem 19 suggested that a democracy is a power structure in which the struggle for power has undergone a revolutionary transformation. In virtually all power structures before its arrival, the transfer of power was accomplished either through a coup d'etat or through familial succession, right? Either you inherited the throne or you took the throne by force. In a democracy, this transfer of power sees the party in power voluntarily relinquishing its power at the will of the electorate. Check. And so we know that it's the electorate in a republic that's still in charge, that still holds the key to power. In this sense, it's a revolutionary step in the evolution of the acquisition and the loss of power and is a, a watershed in the search for stability, stability in a political economy. Having the people rising to create a form of government in and of themselves that takes the political economy and makes a state to ensure that political economy is a huge step. It's no longer at the, the it's no longer the driving force of the monarch, right? It's the people themselves who are imposing on themselves a capitalistic form of, uh, a, a capitalistic economy that's going to rise up in a state that's going to focus and um, be a foundation for that political economy, that capitalist society. This is important because when we get to socialism, this is all going to get turned on its head. So we kind of have to agree very quickly that we're talking about the political economy, the free market, right, Basai fair the invisible hand in the market, as being expressly established by the people through the Constitution. Okay, good. Because Marx is going to disagree wholeheartedly. So you have classic liberalism <laughs> and social liberalism and new liberalism. So you may hear these terms interchangeably. There's also neoliberalism. Now, neoliberalism refers to the economic liberalism, the classic laissez-faire liberalism, and new liberalism or, or um, social liberalism refers to the progressive elements in our mm, classic liberal manifestation in the United States specifically, but also in Paris, or in Paris, in France and in Britain, where you take elements of socialism, elements of classic Marxist socialism, and elements of capitalism and merge them. You kind of create a middle path, a compromise between classic liberalism and Marxist socialism. So the middle path between 
laissez-faire capitalism and Marxist socialism is in new liberalism or social liberalism. And so some of the key thinkers here are going to be Jeremy Bentham, John Stuart Mill, and a contemporaneous, um, a contemporary author, Peter Suber, who I'm going to introduce you to, and I think you'll like him a lot. So Jeremy Bentham then introduced um, in his work the introduction of principles of morals and legislation whether we're doing, um, come on, Mike. I just misspoke, sorry. Ah. So Jeremy Bentham is going to take the idea of utilitarianism or the best for the most people and ask if we try to achieve that in a self-interested sense or for a moral purpose. In other words, if we're looking at utilitarianism, if the best for the all is true, the best for the many is true, do we want that out of a sense of morality? Do we want that because it's right? Or do we do that because it's self-interest? Are we doing it for our own good? This is an interesting question because again, when we get to Karl Marx, the idea of the proletariat rising up and taking the reins of production and taking the reins of government away from the bourgeois, the capitalists, right, the, the, the owners of the uh, production, we're going to see then a subtle difference between these two concepts of self-interest and moral interest. So Jeremy Bentham says in his um, fragment on government regarding utilitarianism, Democratic government was a means to an end. Bentham did not believe that the popular will replaced the principle of utility as the criterion of social or political rectitude of what is right. For Benthamites, all government being concerned as it was with the imposition of painful sanctions was by definition itself an evil. Nor, by and large, did Bentham regard even popular government as a proper positive agent in the provision of happiness. The care of providing for his enjoyments ought to be left almost entirely to each individual. The pursuit of happiness in the Declaration of Independence. The principal function of government being to protect him from suffering. Ah, okay, so Bentham is talking about utilitarianism as a moral cause that we're doing it because it's right, not necessarily out of self-interest. John Stuart Mill, another wonderful philosopher, posed another question, and that had to do with doing harm to others in relation to personal liberty. In other words, are we really at liberty? Can we really do anything we want as individuals? The question is, to what extent will we begin to harm others by our actions? And when does government have the ability to quash liberty, but when your liberty, your actions, begin to harm others or impede on others' pursuit of happiness? So the harm principles in John Stuart Mill is expressed... Um, in this instance, I'm going to be reading out of the Histor History of Modern Political Thought um, by Hampshire Monk. And he, in it, they say, in On Liberty, all Mill's worries about the effects of democratization were brought to a head. His introduction sketches his interpretation of the changing role of liberty as a political ideal. Liberty as a political ideal. If wishes were fishes, if the world was great, if we could have full liberty, wouldn't that be fabulous? But the changing role of liberty as a political ideal, in previous ages the people had used the ideal of liberty to establish limitations on power, claiming inviolable rights against the sovereign and establishing representative bodies to enforce them and to otherwise represent their interests, the legislature. Parliament, right? With the progress of democracy, however, the rulers have become less and less distinguishable from the people themselves. 
and the need for limitations on their power has been brought into question. The rule of the people itself, however, has been recognized as the only rule of the, as the rule only of the majority amongst them. And so the possibility of the tyranny of the majority becomes a real danger. There is thus still a role for a principle of liberty in placing limits on the proper range of government's power, even those of democratic, democratic governments. However, Mill goes on, although the danger of such tyranny was originally seen as a danger imposed only through political power, it is also one that can be imposed through the informal sanctions of society. Indeed, these sanctions may be more formidable than many kinds of political oppression. It leaves fewer means of escape, penetrating much more deeply into the details of life, details of life and enslaving the soul itself. Can anybody think of an example then of the tyranny of the majority in a uh, de facto world? Segregation, racial segregation in the South that Martin Luther King had been fighting against. Now, we talked about de jure segregation in chapter five, right? That the government can, in and of itself, impose desegregation, perhaps in schools. But how do you desegregate society? Right, this is something that society imposes on itself. So again, it's society in the majority. Right? The majority in this instance would have been uh, the whites versus the black minority. And so the tyranny of the majority being imposed on the minority. All right, so Mill is prescient then in his On Liberty. So at what point then can we really be free to express ourselves, or at what point can we be stopped, rather, when we harm other people? check. And so if you're the majority and you're white and you want to impose your majority will, when can you be stopped? When your will is limiting the freedom, the individuality, the expression of the minority. So even the society can be stopped. So then what we're doing then is we're nibbling around the edges of the beginning of paternalism or parentism. Paternalism, now, we can use the term uh, parentism if we want to be gender neutral, but as we know in English, we default to the male. We default to the male assignation. So if you're talking about somebody who you don't know is a boy or a girl, you usually refer to them as a he right, or they. So we defer to the masculine in the language. So paternalism is actually correct. If you want to be politically correct, parentalism is fine. The idea is the same. So this is Suber, Peter Suber, writing about paternalism then and the rise of the nanny state. You may have heard this term, the nanny state. It's getting bandied about a lot. So this is important because if you're talking about new liberalism or social liberalism, you're beginning to get away from classic liberalism idea of that the individual is supreme. And now you're bringing in elements of except when that individual can harm others. Then you're going to begin to ask, what is harm? Right? And then what is harm says, by not wearing a motorcycle helmet, is Cassidy harming me? Ah, so this is the question. When is his liberty to not wear a motorcycle helmet going to impose on my liberty? And how do we as a society make that judgment? You with me? This is actually very society. It's very exciting. Well, yeah, Gordon. The gun thing seems to be... Guns, absolutely. Because, you know, it's... When, when does it cross the line of, you know, our freedom for pursuit of happiness when we're walking around? Right. You know, no, never known who's kid got a gun and when somebody's going to open fire. Right. But they have their, their freedom of, yeah, so. Exactly my point. Exactly my point. So this is, before we can get to this, you're absolutely right, but before we can get to those specifics, we have to get our groundwork done first, right, to see what the theorists are saying here. So Suber says, and this is going to be a long read, you, you with me? I think you'll find it interesting. Okay. <laughs> Paternalism comes from the Latin potter, right, which means to act like a father or to treat another person like a child. 
Again, parentalism is a gender neutral anagram of paternalism. In modern philosophy and jurisprudence, it is to act for the good of another person without that per person's consent, as parents do with children. It is controversial because its end is benevolent, but its means are coercive. Parentalists advance people's interests, such as life, health, and safety, at the expense of their liberty. In this, paternalists suppose that they can make wiser decisions than the people for whom they act. Sometimes this is based on presumptions about their own wisdom or the foolishness of other people and can be dismissed as presumptuous. But sometimes it's not. It can be based on relatively good knowledge as in the case of paternalism over young children or incompetent adults. Sometimes the role of paternalist is thrust upon the unwilling as when we find ourselves the custodian and proxy for an unconscious or perhaps severely mentally limited relative. Paternalism is a temptation in every arena of life where people hold power over others. Think about your own life and where you hold power over others. And when you exhibit paternalism, you know better than them what's good for them and how intoxicating that can be, right? And how um, tempting it can be to stop them from making mistakes for their own good. So... Paternalism is a temptation in every area of life where people hold power over others in child rearing, education, therapy, medicine. But it is perhaps nowhere as divisive as in criminal law. Whenever the state acts to protect people from themselves, it seeks their good, surely, but by doing so through criminal law, it does so coercively, right, or against their will. So which acts should be criminalized and which acts are none of the state's business? How far does one have a right to harm oneself or to be different or to be wrong? To what extent should people feel free to do what they want if others are not harmed? All right, so this is Mill. What is harm? When is consent free and knowing? When do we think clearly and wisely enough and when are we sufficiently free of duress and indoctrination to be left to follow our own judgment, and when should we be restrained by others? Who should restrain whom, and when? These are the questions raised by paternalism. So this is new socialism. This is the idea of the greatest good for the greatest number, utilitarianism, actually finding expression in law, right? So going from theory and philosophy to actual criminal law. So if you get on your bike without riding your motorcycle, and you get a ticket, they're coercing you. Oh, wait a minute. They're coercing you. Because we're in a democratic republic, they is us. Before we examine the issues more closely, consider the wide variety of paternalistic legislation. So acts which can be prohibited by criminal law, but have been alleged by any have not been alleged by any serious writers to be victimless or harmless, at least for consenting adults, include the following. Riding a motorcycle without a helmet. Gambling. Sodomy. Prostitution. Polygamy. Making and selling pornography. Selling and using marijuana. Practicing certain professions without a law, without a license, like law, medicine, <laughs> education, massage, being a hairstylist. What about purchasing blood or organs? Suicide. Assisting suicide, swimming at a beach without a lifeguard, God forbid, using to participate, come on Mike, refusing to participate in a mandatory insurance or pension plan, mistreating a cadaver, loaning money at usurious interest rates, paying a worker less than minimum wage, even though the worker wants that pay, selling a prescription drug without a prescription, Aggressive panhandling, nudity at public beaches, truancy, flag burning, dueling, ticket scalping, blackmail, blasphemy. All these then are victimless crimes that the society has said, thou shalt not under coercive elements, thou shalt not or face pain of fine, imprisonment, etc. 
So paternalism protects people from themselves as if their safety were more important than their liberty. By contrast, the harm principle, first articulated by Mill, holds that limiting liberty can only be justified to prevent harm to other people, not to prevent self-harm. Mill was very clear about that. More precisely, coercion can only be justified to prevent harm to unconsenting adults, not to prevent harm when the actors are completely consenting. The usual legal prescriptions of murder, rape, arson, and theft are not paternalistic. That's not what I'm talking about. Since these acts harm unconsenting others. For the same reason, criminal legislation in these areas is consistent with the harm principle. Legal paternal paternalism and the harm principle come into conflict over competent self-harm and the risk of self-harm, harm to consenting others, and harmless acts. Still with me? So the harm principle demands that we tolerate all three types of act, but paternalists wish to regulate them. If a com competently consenting person is not a victim, then these type, three types of acts are victimless. Again, if a com competently consenting person is not a victim, then these acts are victimless. Under the harm principle, victimless crimes must be decriminalized and virtually all paternalism over competent adults ended. That's classic liberalism. New liberalism or social liberalism then creates the harm principle um, that is on steroids, that takes the next step to protect us from us. Does anybody like donuts? Anybody at all? Okay. Yeah, yeah. Right, and you know that their FDA is moving to ban trans fats. Right? They have already. Okay, exactly. And so trans fats are what donuts are usually fried in, right? And so trans fats are bad for you. Yes. We know this. Well, that's the question. Do we know this? Do we have sufficient knowledge? Each individual person know that that donut made with trans fats could actually harm you. Evidence is shown. So if you're going to ban trans fats, you're doing it for the non-consenting adult. Because unless you have the knowledge that trans, unless I can assure you, each and every one of you have the knowledge that trans fat is bad, if I sell you a trans fat donut, then I'm culpable in your demise. So you have to stop me. Government has to stop me from selling you a donut that's going to kill you. Does this make sense? So consent means information. You have to be able to know that something is bad for you. Now, riding a motorcycle without a helmet, you would think is kind of a no-brainer, literally. Right? <laughs> Sorry, that came out wrong. Right? But, you know, so consent, then, is being coerced. Ah. When does an act harm only the actor? Informed people disagree on whether the valid consent of recreational drug users or truants covers all the people likely to be harmed by drug use or truancy. If an act harms others, can we be sure that it only harms consenting others? This can be difficult to ascertain, especially if we concede with Mill that every act affects everyone, if only indirectly and remotely. A motorcycle rider who consents to the risks of riding without a helmet and who suffers traumatic head injury may harm people who did not consent his emotional and financial dependence, fellow members of his insurance pool, and taxpayers who support highway patrols, ambulance services, and public hospitals. If increasing my taxes or insurance premiums harms me for the purposes of the harm principle that Mill discusses, then I might be harmed by the act in which a motorcycle rider thought was private and self-regarding to not wear their helmet. This special application of the harm principle is called the public, charged, public charge argument for coercion. It is not paternalistic, argues Suber, since it is directed against harm to unconsenting others, not against self-harm. If we can prohibit riding a motorcycle rider without a helmet because of the harmful public charge it levies on me, 
right, the unconsenting adult, then we could prohibit that damn donut with the trans fat on the same grounds. Now, in a welfare state, which shifts costs to compensate those who harm themselves, virtually all self-harm will be other harm too. So anything you do to risk your health, if I'm going to be paying for your health care, then anything that you do potentially has the ability to harm me, including jogging, mountain biking, crossing the street. Yes? So when is consent valid? Dueling was outlawed in large part because lawmakers believed that even those who seemed to consent to a duel were giving invalid consents procured through extreme pressure and duress. You don't really want a duel, right? Duel with a sword or a pistol, right? But you have to because peer pressure was so intense, you really didn't have a choice not to. Oh, remember prayer in the football huddle before school? Or before in a football game? Yeah. Right, this is the same idea. When peer pressure is so sharp, and so prevalent that you can't just say no. So today one hears informed people disagree on whether prostitutes, drug addicts, um, indigent buyers of lottery tickets, workers willing to take less than minimum wage, and students <laughs> um, doing anything to get a good grade um, are all valid consents. So what is harm? What a, is public nudity harmful? Is peddling quack remedies for cancer harmful? Is divorce harmful? Television violence, violence in the movies. Well-funded commissions and independent social scientists disagree on whether pornography tends to harm women as a class. Liberals and radicals disagree on whether offended sensibilities is a kind of harm. Is harm by admission harm in the relevant sense? If I choose to stop by a highway accident to render aid, or if I refuse to donate a kidney to somebody who needs it, have I caused harm? If these acts and omissions are harmless, then to prohibit them is paternalism or legal moralism. If they are harmful, then to prohibit them is justified by the harm principle. Okay, so Peter Suber, paternalism in the nanny state. What we're trying to do then is to look at the evolution from classic liberalism to new liberalism or social liberalism. Taking the idea of the harm principle and utilitarianism and applying it to today's culture, today's political society. Liberalism, classic liberalism was Age of Enlightenment, which is going to be Voltaire and the, the 1750s. Um, Dickens is going to be writing a lot about industrial age England and the plight of the poor and the plight of the, plight of the working class. And so new liberalism is going to come in the 1860s, 1890s, in the early 1900s. In the United States, it's going to be called progressivism. Progressivism is going to be like prohibition, is going to be an evidence of that. Um, prohibition was intended to protect those people who would abuse alcohol from themselves. So that's paternalism. We're going to coerce you into stopping drinking by taking away your drink completely. I mean, that's like it. But this is social liberalism because you're using the good of this or the power of the state to assure the good of the individual whereas before the individual in classic liberalism was kind of on their own to determine what their life liberty and pursuit of happiness is now the state is going to impose on you what we think is good for you right exactly does that help oh good okay so the next step then is to look at statism or nationalism and very quickly, the state is the form of government that's going to bring the nation together, the people of the nation together. The state is the form of government that is manifesting from the nation. So bear with me and I'll go into this and I'll explain it. There is 
um, the sense of nationhood, a sense of peoplehood, whether that is a political concept, whether it's a, a national concept, whether it's um, bloodlines or religious lines, that you come together as a nation, a group of people who identify as an entity. And so it uh, can be a political concept or a political identification. The nation of the United States, the people who are in the United States, as separate from the state of the United States. So, for example, perhaps this might help. In our sense, the nation predated the state. If you have the United States as a, collective, a collection of colonies, right? these people you know, on the North American continent, newly independent from Great Britain, before the United States, the form of government that was created to govern through the Constitution, the nation, the nation already existed. And so we are a state nation. Israel is another good example. Now, in Israel, you have a nation, a group of people who are identified along religious lines. Right? Judaism, right? Jews. They identify along religious lines. And then the, the state of Israel came to manifest, to um, govern those living within the geographic borders of the state of Israel. So first you have the nation based on religious lines, religious identification, and then the state of Israel coming to manifest, to govern that nation. So state and nation aren't the same thing. They aren't the same word. The state is the governing apparatus. The nation is the identification. Now, they're often used interchangeably. And the term nation-state is often used unthinkingly. But it can be a political concept the sense of national nationhood. It certainly can be a political identification. Citizenship certainly is one element of nationhood. I belong to the nation of the United States, this group of people, because I am a citizen. So I am a citizen because the state exists. The state grants me citizenship. So you can see how it's, it can be easily fumbled. Nations usually exist within certain borders, usually, if there's a state overlaying, but not always. Again, there is an emphasis on bloodlines, or racial lines, or religious lines, and these nations aren't tied to borders. I give you the Roma, right, in Europe, who live all across Europe. As a nation, they identify as Roma. But whether they're living in France or in Italy um, or in Belgium or in England, they're still Roma. So that sense of nationhood is still there. In <laughs> Nazi Germany, we're going to find the sense of nation, in this sense, the nation of Aryan ancestry, even though that's going to be a misnomer, and we'll talk about that. The idea that it's that racial identification that's creating a nation and that the state, Germany, this Third Reich, is meant to recollect this nation, to allow this nation to grow. Right? The state is imposed to help, to, to foster the national identity. Nation can be both a positive and a negative force. Here's how. Nationalism serves three important functions. If you're looking at this as an idea as one of those balloons in any given ideology, whether it's classic liberalism, socialism, fascism, authoritarianism, this nationhood first serves to identify. I belong to this nation, or we belong to this nation. So that nationhood is an identification. Secondly, mobilization. I've identified as a member of this nation, and now I'm going to mobilize, I'm going to act, I'm going to actuate based on that identification. If I'm Catholic, perhaps that's a sense of nationhood. It's a, 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 a collective, a group, based on religious sentiment right, or belonging to a church. And so if I'm going to identify as a Catholic, what does that look like when I mobilize? Go to church. Right? Or 
perhaps I perform acts or volunteerism or anything else that I do uh, by virtue of being a Catholic. So identification, mobilization, but then nations serve to resist other nations as well. I am Catholic because I am not Jewish. I am using my identification to say what I am not. And so it's not a, a, a physical resistance. It's perhaps an emotional or a disqualification with other nations. So if you are of the Aryan nation, you are going to identify as Aryan. You're going to mobilize as Aryan by serving the Third Reich or striving to to help the Third Reich. And in this instance, it's going to be resistance to other nations or those people who are going to try to stop the Third Reich from expanding its living room. So nationalism serves three important functions, identification, mobilization, and resistance to others. Now, I'm talking about you know, citizenship in the United States. I'm talking about you know, being a member of the Catholic Church or what, whatever identification it may be. These are fairly... Um, Milk toast. These are easy, right? What happens though when statism comes into play or statolatry is evidence? Statolatry, which is basically nationalism on steroids, when this identification becomes the end game, it becomes all in all of my existence. It's not just a part of who I am to be a citizen of the United States or a member of X or Y church. Now it is my reason for living. And so nationalism, or, or taken to its extreme, is called statolatry. And this is coined by, as I suggested in the beginning, Ludwig von Meisens in his work, Omnipotent Government, where it's not often an ideology, but more often a part of a broader ideology this sense of nationalism on steroids when you apply it to socialism, when you apply it to fascism, authoritarianism, totalitarianism. Von Meissen says that it would be a mistake to ascribe the ascendancy of modern nationalism to human wickedness. The nationalists are not innately aggressive men. They become aggressive through the conception of nationalism. They are confronted with conditions which were unknown to the champions of the old principle of self-determination, and their prejudices prevent them from finding a solution for the problems they have to face other than that provided by an aggressive nationalism. One of the beautiful things about us against them, the sense of nationhood, nationhood the sense of, of striving and competition, is it gives somebody a purpose to live for. It makes somebody active and alive and impassioned, right? And especially when you're feeling disenfranchised or powerless or downtrodden, the sense all of a sudden of belonging to a bigger, a bigger um, purpose, a more important purpose, gives your life purpose. Now, I'm not just being blithe. I'm thinking now of the fascists in Italy. Italy. In World War II, I'm thinking of the fascists in Germany, the Nazis in Germany, where you take the downtrodden, the broken, the people who are desperate for something to give them purpose, and you give them purpose. And in this instance, it's going to be the state. The state, right? Now we're going to, it's us, right? You have something to fight for, something to live for, and you become innervated. You become infused and impassioned by this participation. That's what I'm after. This sense of statolatry, where your whole life begins to revolve around the state. So, having said that, we turn to socialism. And so socialism derives its name from an underlying assumption that human beings are social and come together in some kind of a social contract. Socialists, this is a very blanket statement, we'll go into more particulars here shortly, believe that personal development can only take place in a healthy community. And a prerequisite to that is material security and well-being for each member of the social order. There's often a confusion between the terms communism and socialism. I don't know if you've felt that. 
And so socialism is the ideology expressed by, in this instance, Karl Marx, uh, Engels, and Trotsky in their writings, to which, and this is pretty much the, the coin, the motto of socialism, from each according to his ability, to each according to his need. Socialism then strives to create a perfect society where, and as I'll suggest, the means of production are taken away from the capitalists and retained by the people. It was inherently an economic model. Marx was writing from an economic standpoint. The social order aspects of socialism are where socialism in theory falter. Marx's theory on economic socialism coming away from laissez-faire ec economics, the free market, Adam Smith, and instead creating a centralized economy or a command economy was one aspect. And he wrote about this in Das Kapital. In the Communist Manifesto, Marx is going to continue that treatise. When you talk about the social order, though, Marxist theory falters, and I'll show you how. Communism is a pragmatic or real-world governmental or a state manifestation of theoretic socialism. Leninism is one example, which is exemplified by democratic centralism. So communism is a state manifestation of the ideology of Karl Marx and classic Marxist socialism. In other words, just like classic liberalism, you have contracts and law, property, equality, democracy. How does classic liberalism manifest? You look at the United States, you can say, yeah, I see elements of this, I can also see where we fail. Marxist socialism is an ideology that's expressed through many different types of communism. They're not perfect manifestations of Marxist socialism, just like the United States isn't the perfect manifestation of classic liberalism, or now new liberalism, or new socialism. So Leninism, then, or communism as originally created in Russia, right, falling, failing, come on, Mike, after the fall of the Tsar, Leninism is exemplified, or can be seen through its lens of democratic centralism or centralizing the means of production or an economic model. Communism as an economic model striving to achieve Marxism. Now, as we're going to suggest, Leninism or communism often very quickly diverges from classic Marxist theory very quickly. And it's not always going to be a good fit, a good match. Communism can't exist without socialism. Communism is a manifestation of socialism. socialism. It tries to manifest socialism. Hasn't a true communist state never came to be, though? No, because communism is a manifestation. What you, I think what you mean to say is, hasn't a pure Marxist state? Yeah. Right. Which is? Right. No it's a, right. Right. And there are reasons for that. Well, and also regional differences, cultural differences, political differences, and people inherent, right? So when you have Russia, you have people who had just come out of however many hundreds of years of Tsarist authoritarian statism, right? And now you're coming into Marxist socialism. The culture at the time wouldn't allow it. Just like the fall of the Weimar Republic after World War I, right, in Germany, allowed for Hitler's rise, because the people had been used to an authoritarian, in this instance, the Kaiser, an authoritarian monarchy, right, in Germany, and now all of a sudden you have a democracy. It didn't fit the culture, right, and so it fails. So culture has a lot to do with it. It's not necessarily just the, the system of government, it's the system of government imposed on uh, people. Okay. So going back then, to get a feel for Marxist socialism, just as we did with classic liberalism and new liberalism, we go to the philosophers. 
right, to see what they were saying, what the influences were on Marx, and what he was trying to say in his work. So first I give you Thomas More and his work, Utopia, in 1515. So this is being written during the time of Henry VIII, if we remember him, right, who was a very authoritarian monarch. He used his authority well. So Thomas More was writing, in this sense, it was satire. It would be what would happen in the absence of a strong monarch. What would it look like to have, in this sense, a socialist community? What would that look like? And so what he was doing was he was posing a question that's very important because he was writing in the time of Henry VIII who could have easily lost his head over this work. So he tried to frame it in that it was praise for Henry's reign. It was praise for the form of government they had by belittling, in this instance, utopia and rather making fun of it and, and lessening its, its um, value vis-a-vis -vis Henry VIII's reign. But really he was asking the questions, what would it look like to be a true socialist model? So here's some of the things he came up with. His um, influences, by the way, were Plato's Republic. That echoes throughout. So in Utopia, in this, in this society, this made-up society that Thomas More creates, this, this socialist society, the basic unit of society is the household. In and among society, trades are assigned by aptitude as well by, as by choice, with the exception of agricultural labor, because it's so hard and nobody really wants to do it. So everybody has to do it. Everybody has to serve their turn in agriculture. Um, so the utopians had a draft whereby people would have to work on the farms for a certain amount of time, conscripting the entire populace to perform labor on the f in the fields, on the farms. Since utopians treasure leisure instead of property, the work week was rather short. However, leisure was subjective. How you spent your leisure time, since we're living in a collective, you couldn't just go home and watch TV. Your participation in society, again, going back to the, the, the motto, from each according to his ability, to each according to his needs, from each according to his ability, said, you don't go home and watch TV. In your leisure time, you're going to improve yourself. And so your leisure time was going to be sent, spent studying philosophy, gardening, attending lectures, right? And if one didn't like such hobbies, that's okay. You were encouraged to simply work more. But your leisure time was going to be productive. Ah. So everyone goes to bed at the same time and sleeps the same number of hours. Since we're all working collectively, since all our efforts are collected, we all have to give the same. We have to give the same effort. So everybody goes to bed at the same time, gets the same hours of sleep. Nobody, no one person is working longer hours than the other, unless, of course, you don't want to. I go to the lectures. There's little privacy. There's no locks on the doors. There is no private property in Utopia. You don't own anything. We own everything. So there are no locks on the doors. And there aren't any really doors except to close off against inclement weather. Travel to and from one town to another um, would need a permit from the authorities. If you were to leave your home and go to another town, you had to get permission. And um, if you were expected to stay more than one week, you were expected to pick up work in your new location. So it wasn't that you couldn't travel to another town. You needed permission, and if you were gone for a long time, you had to work while you were there. Houses are maintained publicly and are identical. And in order for us not to get attached to one house or another, we all switched every 10 years. Right? It's not your house, it's our house. Right? So everybody moves constantly so that there's no sense of property, there's no sense of ownership. People wear simple homespun clothing, and since everyone wore the same style and fabric, there was no better than. Everybody wore the same thing. War was engaged only to secure the borders, 
to bolster allies, or to relieve oppressed peoples. Utopians used mercenaries. They hired soldiers for the most part. And when citizens did become engaged in a battle or in the war effort, women who enjoyed full citizenship, remember this is 1515, women enjoyed full citizenship and had to fight alongside the men. Utopians gave quarter to non-combatants. In other words, um, they would, in a, in a battle, if you um, raised the white flag, you would be um, given quarter. You wouldn't be attacked. You wouldn't be killed. You wouldn't be harmed. In other words, you would be taken as a prisoner of war. Um, trade was only for iron, um, utopia being mostly self-sufficient. So within utopia, within this perfect society, we created everything that we needed. Now what he's doing is he's talking about England, and England needed iron. And so it's not surprising them that England as a utopia model would need iron, so he brought in iron. Culture was an attempt to combine the best of ancient classical tradition with Christian goals of equality and faith, but toleration of different creeds was a set policy in utopia. Utopian government is local. They call it a sty, rather like a pig sty, right? Made up of 30 households, and each sty elects a sty ward, right? Or somebody to coordinate the activities of the 30 households. For every 10 sty wards, there was a, a bench eater, so we're talking about parliament, right? Who participates in the national parliament. With the exception of the mayor who is seated for life, everyone is elected for one year. So this is an echo back to classic Athens, right? Or Plato's uh, Republic, everybody's elected for one year and you can't repeat, right? And so there's no political careers. Everybody's serving the state. No political discussions were allowed outside of the chambers. And similarly, no legislation could be discussed on the day that it was first introduced. Parliament had two jobs, to direct goods and labor to where rational needs are the greatest and conduct foreign policy. So this is where we're getting into Marxist ideology. It didn't legislate. If you don't have private property, you don't need law to protect private property. Just common sense or common law. What is right and what is wrong. Okay. So Hegel, George William Friedrich Hegel, is one of the most famous, influential, and difficult to understand of all the philosophers in, in my book. He portrayed the state as an ethical idea that embodies the collection of the aspirations of society. So again, the state is the system of government that is an ethical ideal. Right? It's trying to embody the collective aspirations of the society. And so his influence on Marx, then, again from this awful book that I had referred to early, earlier, history, says Hegel, is a dialectical movement. It is reasoning. It debates. It sees itself as evolving, right? Almost a series of revolutions in which people after people and genius after genius become the instrument of the absolute. Great men are not so much begetters as midwives of the future, and they bring forth the zeitgeist, this collective consciousness, the spirit of the age. These great men bring forth the spirit of the age. Such individuals had no consciousness of the general idea that they were unfolding. Nobody can see the complete puzzle. Nobody can see the complete picture. But you contribute what small elements to the complete picture that you can. They had an insight into the requirements of the time that was ripe for development. And so this really is Marx. Marx was writing at a time in English society, in London, during the industrial age, the height of the Dickensian London with the, the child labor and the you know, six, seven day work weeks, 16 hour work days, working yourself to the bone, no protection for workers, no safety, no consideration for workers' rights at all, right? So this is Dickens, the Dickensian age, the industrial age. 
And so Marx then is going to rise. He's going to see a small piece of this. He's going to try to express from his angle what might be the future, the progression of the future. And so Marx says Frederick Engels, who was his um, co-author, who published most of Marx's books posthumously, but also wrote his eulogy, said that Marx was the best hated and most calumated man of his time. Governments from absolutists, both absolutist and republican, deported him from their territories. The bourgeois, whether conservative or ultra-democratic, vied with one another in heaping slanders upon him. All this was brushed aside as though it were a cobweb, ignoring it, answering only when extreme necessity compelled him. And he died beloved, revered, and mourned by millions of revolutionary fellow workers from the mines of Siberia to California and all parts of Europe and America. And Engels says, I make bold to say that although he may have had many opponents, he hardly had one personal enemy, and that his name will endure through the ages, and so also will his work. Well, that may be true, but as I'll show you, Bernard Shaw in 1884 wrote a letter that was published called Who is the Thief? And it is a um, damnation of Marxist socialism, and so I'll come back to that in a moment. Let's look at a couple of the types of socialism that can be drawn from Marxist socialism. Christian socialists, for example. Those on the Christian left whose politics are both Christian and socialist, or they believe in this collective good, the society coming together to create the best environment for everybody, and from each according to his ability to each according to his need. Christian socialists draw parallels to what some have characterized as the egalitarian and anti-establishment message of Jesus, who according to Christian gospel, spoke against the religious authorities of his time and the egalitarian, anti-establishment, and sometimes anti-clerical message of most contemporary socialisms. So this is libertarian, come on Mike, liberation theology. And liberation theology was a movement in South and Central America in the 1980s and the 1990s that tried to use socialism in a Christian context to use Christianity, especially in the Catholic Church, to drive a political end, a socialist political end, liberation theology. There's also revolutionary socialism, and this is what Marx had predicted, where the people, the, the proletariat, the workers of the world would unite, and by sheer force of history, by sheer force of need, would revolt. And so revolutionary socialism is the idea expressed in Marxist ideology that supports establishing socialism through revolution. The people of the world, the workers of the world uniting, right? Instead of evolving naturally through existing parliamentary socialism or democratic socialism. So this is, this is kind of where I'm, I'm leading you down the primrose path. Marx said that there is this collective this greater good that we come together to ensure the best lives for everybody. We do that collectively. How that looks, how that's expressed is communism. Doesn't work. What does work though in classic liberalism and capitalistic society can be mitigated. Maybe we can get the best of both worlds. Maybe we can get the core ideas of individualism, property, contracts, and law, freedom, equality, and marry it to this, this assurance that everybody has his basic needs met. Healthcare, an income, a sust sustenance level income, right? So what we're talking about, my friends, is democratic socialism, or parliamentary socialism, or New liberalism. Democratic socialism is a broad political movement propagating the ideas of socialism within the context of a democratic system. Its adherents promote the ideal of socialism as an evolutionary process resulting from legislation enacted in and 
by a constitutional democracy. So, okay, here we are, 2013, and we're looking at our system of government. Oh gosh, I hope I've done my do job right. You're in it. State-supported education. Classic liberalism, not so much. Individualism, right? I'm not gonna pay for your education. I, the taxpayer, am not gonna pay for you. That's classic liberalism. Democratic socialism, new liberalism, says that the greater good insists that we educate as many as possible, that the, the, the good of the whole will be improved if we support education. And so here we are in a state-supported educational system, both the community colleges, the UCs, the CSUs, right? Social Security. Now, this is 1930s. Right? This is a New Deal piece of legislation. What? 1930s? Yeah. Where you have a sustenance income level. Where you have an income level under which the aged or the infirm cannot drop. That we as a collective guarantee some kind of, some kind of a safety net. Welfare. Medicare. Healthcare. And we can see how it progresses. It's not that it's a bad thing, but we have to remember we're doing it through the democratic process, through a constitutional republic, or in a constitutional republic. Does that make sense? Yes. Good. Okay. So, again, communism, not so much. Communism as an ideology that seeks to establish a future classes, classless, stateless social organization based, loosely, on an interpretation of Marxism that includes common ownership of the means of production and the absence of private property, a la Utopia, Thomas More. So communism, again, just to put a final nail in this coffin, can be classified as a governmental expression of the broader socialist ideology. So whether you're in China or North Korea or Russia or Cuba, you're gonna have different manifestations of communism. There are some socialist countries that might well be classified as communist, if you thought of it, and I'm thinking those parliamentary democracies who have a very strong socialist bent. All right, so I promised you a letter by George Bernard Shaw. I said that Marx had few personal enemies, but he sure had a lot of detractors, right? And so George Bernard Shaw is going to be writing in 1884. Let me put this matter to you more closely and with economic precision. If you have the adopted the theory of surplus value put forward by the late Dr. Karl Marx, a man of great talent, but one who, with unexampled ingratitude, devoted his life to casting odium upon the civilization whose culture he inherited, whose society he enjoyed, whose literature instructed him, whose labor supported him, whose inventions enabled him to survey the globe and transverse its continents, in whose cradle his children slept, and in whose midst his own life was passed. His theory, as I understand it, is that the capitalist, having a monopoly of raw material and means of production, refuses to the laborers access to these materials, and means until they agree to surrender to him the produce of their labor, minus only the smallest sum upon which they can maintain themselves and their families. I hardly need to point out the preposterous absurdity of a theory which assumes that the laborer is helplessly dependent on the capitalist in the face of the axiom that labor is the source of all wealth, an axiom which no political economist has ever denied and which Marx himself insisted on as the foundation of socialism. How can the laborer be at the mercy of the upper and middle classes when they are admittedly dependent on the laborer for their very sustenance? And it goes on. So that's George Bernard Shaw, 1884. 
and the letter is called, Who is the Thief? So, now, I promised that we would have a roadmap that links back these core tenets of Marxist socialism to new liberalism and classic liberalism. And so here's the starting place for that, and then we're going to take our break. In Marxist socialism, you have a very strong sense of nationalism. Again, the state is coming. Nationalism is a sense of collective, that we are a group. We are this group of people who are coming together. We are a nation, right? The state is going to exemplify that. It's going to manifest that. But that sense of nationalism is a key component of Marxism. We are going to mobilize. We are going to identify, mobilize, and resist others. So we have to come together. We have to coalesce and identify first. Next is the abolition of private property. There is no private property. We own everything. The collective owns everything. And so property is relative. We have the public ownership of the means of production. No longer do the capitalists, the people who own the means of production, control the proletariat, control the workers, and pay you only what the market will bear, the natural price, for your labor. Right Now, we own the means of production, and so if there's any profit to be made, it's going to be made by we. Right? There is an equality of income from each according to his ability, to each according to his need. And so we all have basic needs as human beings. And so there is an equality of income. No one person is going to be rich or poor. We're going to spread it out evenly. This is going to be done through a planned economy and centralized planning in a state monopoly. The state is going to own all the apples. And we're going to set the price for the apples. Right? And then the good of the collective, in order for socialism to work, from each according to his ability to each according to his needs, the, collective of the, the good of the collective is more important than the good of the individual. The individual has to pony up. You can't take a day off work, because if you take a day off work, we all suffer because we lose your productivity. We are more important than you, because we're all depending on all of ourselves in this system. Good, okay, so take a deep breath, let's compare. So in classic liberalism, I said you have individualism, property, contracts and law, freedom, equality, and democracy. Now in new liberalism or new social, oh, come on, in new liberalism or social liberalism, you have these elements mitigated by paternalism, the nanny state, and the welfare state, that the state exists. Now, this isn't welfare in a welfare program. This is the state assuring the welfare of everybody, the nanny state, making sure that we're all protected and well. So classic liberalism mitigated or brought into new liberalism by paternalism. Okay. So we take those key tenets of classic liberalism, and now we juxtapose them, yes, to socialism. The good of the collective is more important than the good of the individual. So individualism as a core tenet is gone. It's replaced with the good of the collective is more important. In classic liberalism, you have the property and the right to own property. Locke, John Locke, right? Life, liberty, and the pursuit of property, that your property is your, your joy, your happiness. Well, we've done away with that. There is the abolition of private property. There is no more private property. You have the public ownership of the means of production, equality of income, a planned economy and centralized planning through a state monopoly, and nationalism, a very strong sense of nationalism as the collective. Wow, so these are very different. These two sets of balloons in these ideologies are very different. But you'll see that what's going on over here in socialism Marxist socialism is going to be filtering into classic liberalism. A lot of the elements that you're finding here are the elements inherent in paternalism, that the state knows better than the individual, that the individual and it's your responsibility to me, a la uh, doing no harm, 
is mitigated. And so the evolution from classic liberalism to new liberalism is going to be forced by the introduction of the core tenets of socialism in the 1860s on through the 1910s. Good. So, <coughs> next, anarchism. What happens when you have no government? And so, just very quickly, because this is an ideology as well, and it deserves to be recognized. You know, you're talking about utopian societies, and in our anarchistic societies, especially locally, there have been a number of um, societies who strive to be, who, who, who purport to be anarchistic or without government. And so anarchism is a generic term that describes any number of various political philosophies and social movements that advocate the illumination of all forms of imposed authority, including religious and social hierarchy as well as any coercive power to make you do something. And so this harkens back to the Archons of Athens. The Archon was the executive that affected the will of the people. They could have periods without an Archon or without an executive, long periods of time, and those were called anarchonistic periods or periods without an Archon, and that's where it comes from, no government or no executive, just the will of the people. And so, in place of hierarchy, these movements favor relations based on voluntary cooperation. And it's usually very much so at the local level. And mutual aid, leading to a society characterized by the ability of each actor to have a say in the outcomes proportionate to the degree, to the degree that they're affected by them. It makes sense then if we're talking about socialism, you know, as a collective effort to achieve the best for all, anarchism says, let's do that at the local level and have the person who is most affected by the decision have the greatest proportion of say in that decision. Makes sense. So the philosophical anarchist, though, uh, thought does not advocate chaos. We tend to think of anarchists as chaos, uh, proponent, proponents of chaos. Uh, bombings. This is a misnomer. Uh, it's a mischaracterization. Uh, anarchy is a manner of human relations that is intentionally established and maintained. So it's not the total absence of government, it's the absence of imposed or hierarchical government suggesting instead a local system of cooperation. So a utopian society, as you were talking on in the break, in Northern California is lousy with utopian societies. You have Harbin Hot Springs, right? Not, what, 20 minutes from here, half hour from here, up in Middletown, that was for a great period of time a utopian society that was, uh, that was maintained there. In the hills above Fountain Grove in Santa Rosa, there was a utopian society, um, Thomas uh, Lake Hill. Yes, Thomas Lake Hill, who formed a utopian society in the hills above Fountain Grove. It's, it's, they're usually short-lived, uh, but anarchism then sees its roots in ancient Greece, again, with the first instance of anarchism being a philosophic ideal in the Stoic philosopher Zeno of Elena, who was the best exponent of anarchistic philosophy in ancient Greece. He repudiated the omnipotence of the state, its intervention and its regimentation, and proclaim the sovereignty of moral law, of the moral law of the individual. So the individual's participation at the, at the local level in those decisions that are going to affect the most. Henry David Thoreau, you may be familiar with, was a large proponent, especially of governing at the, at the local level. Yeah, well, from the feminist perspective, for those feminists in the room, we have Emma Goldman, who was an anarchist, um, living in the United States, very influential, especially um, prior to World War I. She was also an ardent femi feminist and brought the, the ideas of anarchism and feminism together. Yeah. So anarchism, not the, um, the violent overthrow of government, rather the absence of hierarchical or imposed coercive government. Bring anarchism up and why I didn't want to skip by it is because this is its polar opposite. Authoritarianism, totalitarianism, and fascism. So this is the motto of Mussolini's Italy. 
and I think it says it all, just like with socialism from each according to his ability, this says it all for fascism. Tutto nello stato, niente allo di fuori del stato, and nulla contro lo stato. My Italian is awful. But everything in the state, nothing outside the state, and nothing against the state. The state is all in a fascist society. So that motto then is going to speak to fascism and define fascism for us. For the fascist, everything is in the state and neither individuals nor groups are outside the state. For the fascist, the state is the absolute. The state, the collective, is everything. Before which individuals or groups, as in the United States or in, uh, in our political culture, interest groups, PACs, even political parties, are only relative. This, they, only, they are only allowed if the state allows them. I'm going to introduce the key elements of the fascist state first, and then we'll revisit. The fascist state exalts the nation, the collective, above the individual. It uses violence and modern techniques of propaganda and censorship to forcibly suppress political opposition. And I have two key examples of that coming on. It engages in economic and social regimentation. Again, if the individual is only an element within the state, then what the individual does, both professionally, in their leisure time, in their private lives, is up to the state. The individual is relative to the state. It engages in corporatism, and I'll define that. And by nature of being authoritarian, it often implements a totalitarian regime. And I'll define those two distinctly um, at the end. Etymologically, you may remember the fasci, right? Or the bundle of sticks that I use to exemplify federalism. This fasci is actually on our dollar bill. It's actually a symbol that's in the Senate. It's a symbol of strength through numbers. And in a federalist model, that makes perfect sense. But it's the root of fascism, fasci. And it goes back to the Italian political history that stretches back to the 1890s where the radical leftist political factions prolif proliferated before World War I. So remember I said that when you have a disenfranchised group of people, they often look for some kind of a collective identification to give their lives meaning, to give their lives purpose, to give them something to be passionate about. And as I'm going to show you, after World War I, prior to World War I, but also after World War I, leading up to World War II, there were fringe elements in Italian society, disenfranchised young men, predominantly, at the local level, who looked back to the glory days of Rome for their inspiration. Remember I said that the fasci were the symbol of the Roman senators. So Rome had three eras. There was the monarchy, the Republic and the Empire. We're talking about the Middle Rome, the Republic, where it was the Senate and the people of Rome, SPQR, right? The Senate and the people of Rome. So the Senate was the, the, mm, the symbol of the Roman Republic. So what these Italian it, disenfranchised, poor, struggling Italians were looking for was to harken back to Rome's glory days, to when they had it together, when they ruled the world. And this fasci then is a symbol of that. It's a symbol of those glory days. And so they 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 sought to reinvigorate, in reinvent, invigorate this Roman ideal. You try doing this after a twenty hour day, right? <laughs> Thank you. No, I'm just going to agree. So to reinvigorate this Roman ideal, this, this great republic. And so that's what they were striving for when they chose the fasci for their symbol and how they got to be known as fascists. It's the roots. Now, these revolutionary connotations are what made it attractive to the young people of the left who demanded Italian intervention in World War I. 
The fasci they formed were scattered over Italy, and it was to one of these spontaneously created groups that were devoid of party affiliations that the young Mussolini belonged. Remember, Italy wasn't unified as Italy until 1871. Until then, it had been torn apart by competing other competing nation states, France, Austria, uh, Hungary, um, etc. So Benito Mussolini came to power and ruled as dictator from 1922 to 1943. He created a fascist state through the use of state terror and propaganda. He used his charisma, his personal authority, his personal charm, his, his star power, and total control of the media and intimidation of political rivals to achieve success. He disassembled the existing democratic government at the time. So Mussolini then, as a fascist dictator, now, this is what's going to really blow your mind. You ready? With the cooperation, actually, the assistance, the philosophic assistance of the Catholic Church, it was the fascist concept of corporatism, class co collaboration, and economic and so social relations that are very similar to the model laid out by Pope Leo XIII in his 1892 encyclical called Rerum Novarum. Rerum Novarum was the church's answer to Marxist socialism. Socialism was seen as fraught. It was empowering the, the, the masses. It was empowering the workers. And it was disestablishing the power structure. Socialism was intended to take power away from the ruling class and give it to the proletariat. The church in 1892 found this troublesome because as a hierarchical organization, it needed to maintain control. The hierarchy in the Catholic Church was predicated on the political governments of the time supporting its place, especially in Italy. And so the introduction of socialism in Italy was threatening to the Catholic Church at the time. Rerum Novarum, this encyclical then, was the Pope's answer to socialism that spoke to the Industrial Revolution and other changes which occurred in the 19th century. Rerum Novarum criticized capitalism, complaining of the exploitation of the masses in industry, but as well as the socialist concept of the class struggle. So it called for strong governments to undertake to protect their people from exploitation while continuing to uphold private property and a all-in-out rejection of socialism. So seeking to find some principle to compete with and to replace Marxism, Rerum Novarum urged social solidarity between classes and endorsed strong nationalism to preserve what they thought was traditional morality or the status quo. So it proposed, it rerum novarum, this papal encyclical, proposed a kind of corporatism, which is the organization of political societies along industrial lines. So I'll come back to that. Democracy was rejected in rerum novarum in favor of representation by interest groups in order to counterdict what was, cons what was called the subversive nature of Marx. So the Catholic Church in this instance then is backing up the 1919 fascist manifesto. So just like the communist manifesto, 1990 saw the publication of the fascist manifesto it was actually written by Gabriel D'Annunzio, but was attributed to Mussolini. And the manifesto was divided into four sections describing these fascist objectives in political, labor, social, and military slash financial fields. So the fascist manifesto, if we're looking for what the fascists stood for in 1919, 
First, the political. It called for universal suffrage at 18. So we know suffrage is the right to vote. Universal, men, women, black, white, everybody, 18 and over. There's proportional representation on a regional basis. There's voting for women. There's representation at a governmental level from the newly created councils, national councils by economic sector. And so the industrial sectors have an actual place in political society. They're not just interest groups trying to influence government. They are a part of government. This is corporatism. And it called for the abolition of the Senate, and the Senate in the Italian context here was the aristocratic elite balancing the more populist um, lower chamber. In labor and social policy, the manifesto called for an eight-hour day and a minimum wage. 1919. This is pretty progressive. Right? So it's reflecting socialism, but it's calling for mitigated steps. The involvement of workers in industry, the reorganization of the transport sector, in this case in Italy, a revision of the draft law, and what this meant was that wealthy people could no longer buy their way out of the draft, which was true at this point, that everybody had to serve and a reduction of the retirement age from 65 to 55. This was to help cure unemployment. It's a great trick for unemployment when you make you know, a great percentage of the population retire. In military and finance, the fascist manifesto advocated a heavy progressive tax on capital wealth. So the richer you are, the more taxes you paid. The expropriation of religious property. Ah, this is where it began to worry the Catholic Church. Because what now you're doing is you're telling the state that it has the ability, the authority, to expropriate or to take religious property. And when you think about this in Italy, you can see that this is going to include Rome, and to some extent the Vatican. And so now the Vatican is going to get very nervous. The revision of all contracts for military provisions, so patri... Uh, patronage, or giving prime contracts to the favored few is going to be redone. It's going to be recrafted. You're going to have a revision of all contracts for military provisions. And then a sequestration of 85% of all war profits to the state. And so if you're a corporation and you're selling ammunition and you make a profit from that ammunition, it's considered a war profit. And so the state is going to sequester 85% of your profits back to the state. If you're making a profit off the war, the state's going to get a cut. So if you look at it from, from 30,000 feet, in theory, the manifesto combined elements of contemporary democratic and progressive thought, which include franchise reform, the abolition of the elitist Senate, the aristocratic throwback, labor reform, limited nationalization, progressive taxes on wealth, and taxes on war profits. With a corporatist or aligning industry into government, a corporatist emphasis on subsuming class antagonisms, the haves and the have-nots, the proletariat from the capitalists, the owners of the means of production, subsuming class antagonisms to the national effort. So this is Italian fascism. Italian fascism, if I've done my job right, is talking about the state. It's not talking about any kind of a racial identification. It's talking about Italy, the state of Italy, right? A state manifesting the nationhood of Italy. We take fascism, and now we jump over to Germany, and we look at fascism as it's applied along racial lines. So Nazism is considered an offshoot, a notable offshoot, of fascism. It differed from Italian fascism in the emphasis on the state's purpose in serving a racial rather than a national ideal, specifically the social engineering of culture to the ends of the greatest possible prosperity for the so-called master race, 
at the expense of all else and all others. So again, we're going back to the sense of nationhood, and we're no longer looking at it as a citizenship, Italian citizenship. Now we're looking at it along racial lines, the Aryan nation. And so fascism, as it's applied to the Aryan nation, Nazism. So Nazism, then, is a meta-political ideology seeing government as a means to achieve an ideal condition of its people, the nation, the Aryan nation. Fascism, as we know, is squarely anti-socialist. And it is statism because it provides an end to itself, that the state is the final end. The state is the, the, the penultimate goal. Nazism is also called National Socialism or Hitlerism is again a type of fascist or totalitarian ideology. The term is most often used in connection with the dictatorship of Nazi Germany from 1933 to 1945. I make this distinction because there are neo-Nazi elements and neo-fascist elements in today's society and I'll talk about those in a second. Right. So it most often refers to Nazi Germany. So, the idea of leadership consists in consolidating, consolidating the attention of the people, of the nation, against a single adversary and taking care that nothing will split that attention. So, focusing the will of the people on one element. This element is often the leader. The leader of genius must have the ability to make different opponents appear as if they belonged to another category. You have to have the nation behind you completely in a fascist society. The best way to achieve that is in the leader or the leader principle. In Nazi Germany, that was around Hitler. Now, he wrote the book Mein Kampf, right, which explains his ideology that the people flocked to. He saw, as suggested in Mein Kampf, democracy as a destabilizing force because it placed power in the hands of ethnic minorities who he claimed weakened and destabilized Europe. And so when he's talking about ethnic minorities, he's talking about the Jews. Um, and, uh, well, religious minorities, Catholics, um, as well as Romas, and um, others that I'll talk about in a minute. He says there must be no major decisions, but only responsible persons, and the word counsel must be restored to its original meaning. Surely every man will have advisors by his side, but the decision must be made by one man. The leader principle, following one person, following behind the leader as a national identity. So, taking the idea of fascism and the core elements of fascism that I introduced a few minutes ago, we now take that and we step it up the next level, which is key tenets of Nazi ideology. And so we see how these differentiate. There's predominantly racism, right? Because the nation is racially identified. Especially anti-Semitism or hatred of the Jews, anything against the Jews, which eventually, as we know, culminated in the Holocaust. The creation of the Herrenrasse, or this idea of the master race, anti-Slavism, so the Slavic peoples, Hungarians, the Poles, are set aside. There is a belief in Nazi ideology and the superiority of the white Germanic, Aryan, or Nordic races. There is an allowance for euthanasia and eugenics in Nazi ideology with respect to racial hygiene. Now this is three or four ten dollar words at once. So euthanasia is mercy killing, right? Eugenics is <laughs> doing away with the poor and the weak and the, the less than. So if you're talking about those who are mentally challenged, those with mental illness, those with birth defects, anything that's going to water down the master race can uh, be set aside. Right? in respect to racial hygiene. 
That also includes, you'll have to forgive me, this is a, we're all adults, right? Um, in the involuntary sterilization of adults who they didn't want to see reproduce. They had involuntary sterilization programs to make it so that you couldn't have progeny, you couldn't have kids. A belief in the leader principle, a belief in social Darwinism. Now Darwinism is survival of the fittest and social Darwinism or even racialized Darwinism says that the best society, the best race will eventually evolve and will win. So a belief in social Darwinism. A defense of blood and soil, which is the red and the black, which is where the Nazi flag colors come from. Uh, and um, the creation of more living space for Germans in the East. And I can never, never say the German, forgive me for my poor pronunciation. But this is where the annexation of, um, well, Austria came into the fold pretty quickly, but the annexation of Poland and driving into Eastern Europe against the Allied response in order to create more living space for the Henrenas of the master race. The people who are already living in those spaces to be set aside for the master race. So this is fascism as it's applied to Nazism, so a racially identified fascism. And this is in World War II. And I don't want to go into the history of World War II or Nazi Germany, I'm just trying to talk about the ideology. And I so, so I think this kind of exemplifies it. But you say, Mike, this was 50, 60, 70 years ago, right? Long ago. The term neo-Nazism and neo-fascism refer to any social or political movement seeking to revive Nazism or fascism, respectively, and post-dates the Second World War. So, for example, the neo-fascist, now you'll note the uppercase F in this, because you're talking about the fascist regime as it was known in fascist Italy, so it's referring to that fascist movement, so it's capitalized, because you're speaking of a movement, it's named. It's not the ideology, but it's the movement from Italy. So the neo-fascist movement is identified by an admiration of Mussolini, the insignia of fascist Italy, and features specific to Italy. There is also a neo-fascist with a lowercase f movement. Now this is talking about fascism, when you look at it more universally, more globally, that can draw on any eclectic mix, yeah, it's kind of like a, a buffet, take what you want and leave the rest, of attachment to Italian fascism, German Nazism, or other fascisms of other nations. Now, fascism, as we know, is an international phenomenon. There are fascist parties still in existence. More frighteningly, there are fascist parties who hold seats in the European Union's parliament. It's very troubling. It's growing. They're, they call themselves by different names, but they're still neo-fascist with a lowercase f. Neo-fascist parties. So fascism as an ideology is still alive and well and active as a political um, exemplification. Right? That there are actually fascists, of people with fascist ideologies in elected office. It's often a matter of dispute whether a certain government is to be characterized as fascist, authoritarian, or totalitarian, or just a plain old police state. And so I, I, I hesitate to give you this list of states that have been or have been considered fascist. But I'll put them to you and I'll let you decide. If, you, if you're interested in this, you know, please do some more research. But Ill regimes that are alleged to have been either fascist or sympathetic to fascism can include Spain, where the Falange is the name assigned to several political movements and parties dating from the 1930s, and most particularly um, the original movement in Spain, when you have General Franco. Austrofascism is a term which is frequently used to describe authoritarian rule installed in Austria between 1934 and 1938. You have Portugal from 1932 to 1968, although less restrictive than the Italian, the German and Spanish regimes, the Estado Novo regime of Antonio de Oliveira Salazar was quasi-fascist in Portugal. In Greece, 
between 1936 and 1941, and then again from 1967 to 1974, you have two different instances of a neo-fascist regime, uh, dictatorships that are not particularly ideological in nature, but might be characterized as authoritarian rather than fascist. And so how they impose their will um, on, the, on the country um, in such a totalitarian, authoritarian manner suggests that they're fascist, that the elements of fascism apply. In Brazil, many historians have argued that Brazil's Estado Novo under Getulio Vargas was a Brazilian variant of the continual continental fascist regimes. So in South America then, for a period of time, uh, Vargas' regime was aligned with the integratist, integralist party, which was Brazil's fascist movement. Belgium, 1939 to 1945, the violent Rexist movement achieved electoral success in the 30s. Many of its members exist, assisted the Nazi occupation during World War II. It can be considered fascist. Its leader, Joris von Severin, was killed before the Nazi occupation. Slovakia, 1939 to 1944, an interesting development here is the Slovak People's Party was a fascist national movement associated with the Catholic Church. Founded by Father Andrei Hinka, his successor, Monsignor Joseph Tiso, became the Nazis' Quisling. A Quisling is a plant or a puppet leader uh, in nominally independent Slovakia. Romania, this is getting pretty serious here. Romania, 1940 to 1944, the violent Iron Guard took power when Ion Antonescu, forced King Carol II to abdicate. Known as Legionnaires, the Iron Guard was established in July 1927 as the Legion of the Archangel Michael and was changed to the Iron Guard in 1929. One of my favorites, Hungary, 1944 to 1945, Ferenc Szilazy headed the Arrow Cross Party. And though this is a fascinating uh, introduction to fa fascism in Hungary, in 1944, with German support, he replaced um, Admiral uh, Miklos Horthy as the head of the state following Horthy's attempt to um, have Hungary change sides in World War II. Argentina, we're familiar with the Perones. Juan Perón admired Mussolini and established his own pseudo fascist regime. After he died, his third wife and vice president, Isabel Perón, was deposed by a military junta. South Africa, many scholars have labeled the apartheid system built by Milan and Virwood as a type of fascism, a racial fascism. Rhodesia, 1965 to 1978, the racial segregation system by Ian Smith is similarly considered by some to be a form of fascism. So this is fascism and often hand in hand with fascism is authoritarianism and totalitarianism. Authoritarianism and totalitarianism are often key elements in a fascist regime. Authoritarianism is absolute or blind obedience to authority. So how the state imposes its will on the nation, we know those terms now, right? For example, I give you Saudi Arabia under King Abdullah an absolutely authoritarian regime. He has the final say in all things going on in that kingdom. It's authoritarian. Zimbabwe, under Robert Mugabe, is considered authoritarian because he had complete control over what happened. He was able to, to impose his will. North Korea is a great example, right, of an authoritarian regime that's able, absolute control, able to impose their will. Totalitarian is, it's kind of hand in hand, but it's different. To what extent does the state's control reach into private lives? The totality of the state's ability to reach into your lives and determine what you're going to wear, what you're going to eat, what you're going to read, what you're going to watch, right? Um, the internet access, you get the idea, right? And so to control all aspects of public and private life, 
is the goal of a totalitarian regime. So you can see how authoritarianism and totalitarianism often go together and how they can be key elements of a fascist state. Examples of a totalitarian state include Afghanistan under the Taliban, Brazil under uh, Vargas during the dictatorship from 1964 to 1986, Chile under Pinochet, uh, Republic of China under Chiang Kai-shek, how about Iran under the Shah, which was a monarchistic police state? Yep. South Vietnam, South Korea, Singapore during recent periods of their history have also had elements of totalitarianism. All right. Deep breath. So the key elements of a fascist state, once more, include that it exalts the nation above the individual, and we're careful to use nation and not state uses violence and modern techniques of propaganda to, and censorship to forcibly suppress political opposition. It engages in economic and social regimentation. It engages in corporatism. And by nature authoritarianism, it implements a totalitarian regime. So we've breathed this in now. It should sound a little more familiar. Now let's do my friends, our, our, our big reveal to compare these three elements, right? So in classic liberalism, again, individualism, property, contracts and law, freedom, equality, and democracy. In neoliberalism or new liberalism, social liberalism, we know that we include elements of paternalism, the welfare state, and the nanny state. In Marxist socialism, the good of the collective more important than the good of the individual, the abolition of private property, public ownership and the means of production, equality of income, planned economy and centralized planning through a state monopoly, and above all things, nationalism. Fascism. Exalts the political nation above the individual uses violence and modern techniques of propaganda and censorship to forcibly suppress political opposition. It engages in corporatism, or it engages in economic and social regimentation. It engages in corporatism and is by nature authoritarianism, often implementing a totalitarian regime. Huge differences be all, between all three. You see where I'm going with this. And so our seminar question coming from the beginning was to compare and contrast the main elements of classic liberalism, neoliberalism, or new liberalism, Marxist socialism, and fascism. Ah, okay. This is two and a half, three pages for the introduction. All right, this is huge. So what you really want to do is to create a really good thesis statement. All right, just very quickly. So you want to take a stab, anybody? I know I've been talking for three hours, but... Your brains are probably shut off. Forgive me. So much to get out. Anybody want to take a stab at this? Creating a thesis statement? So you want to knock off anything that looks like a question mark, right? Or anything that looks like a question. Well, why don't you just say, like, uh, a key difference between classic liberalism, new liberalism, Marxism, Marxism, Socialism and fascism is... Okay, so what, yes, and what can we say, what would be an overarching element? Or maybe three overarching elements. What are the main differences? Yes. Uh, yes. Um, yes. Nationalism and... Uh, property. property. Personal property. Yay, okay, good. <laughs> Thank you, Clara. Thank you, yes, exactly. Individualism. Nationalism and personal property, right? Those are the big three key differences between all three. All the other ones really are relative, right? Because when you look at new liberalism, there are elements of planned economy in neoliberalism. Neoliberalism is new liberalism as it's applied to the economy. When you look at bailing out the banks, when you look at um, uh, uh, privatization 
of health care. There are elements of the planned economy and centralized planning through a state monopoly that are balloons coming into ours, right? So you can't quite do that. But always, individualism, nationalism, and property are going to be three things that are very clear and very distinct in all three. In all three. They're going to have very different meanings. You know, that the good of the collective is more important than the good of the individual is different than it exalts the political nation above the individual. Here, the individual is still a key element in the social order. They're, they're an important part of the social order. Here, the individual is only relative to the nation, right? Here, the individual is all this starting off place. Yes, exactly. Property, right? Socialized property that everybody owns the means of production. Here, the state owns it. Here, we own it. The state owns it. You are only relative. Here, we own it. Exactly. Good. All right. And nationalism. Nationalism here, <laughs> well, you know, we have a sense of collective. We have a sense of belonging to a nation, but it doesn't drive our ideology by any means. By any means. Right? Here, it's, it's absolutely everything. And here, it helps the collective. Thank you, Clara. You're absolutely right. And so... Uh, what I would suggest, then, is having defined your thesis statement, then, in the next three paragraphs, define classic liberalism, neoliberalism, um, socialism, and fascism, and then the three elements, individualism, property, uh, and nationalism, and conclude. Boy, you have a ten-paragraph essay like that. <laughs>